can turn things into dragons now. Wicked! You mean the flying, roaring, burn down the village sort of dragon? Um, no. It's just a very small transfigured dragon. Oh, shame. Everyone loves a good trilogy. From the Crash Bandicoot PS1 games to the Lord of the Rings film series, good things seem to come in threes. Now, I know the Harry Potter game series is obviously not a proper trilogy, but when I was younger, we had a set that had the first three games in the series, so in my mind, they've always been somewhat linked. Previously, I've looked at the first two games in the series, which went from okay to pretty great. It's time to see how the third game holds up. Let's look at Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. I'm gonna stop doing this, the joke's got old. Once again developed by No Wonder and published by EA, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban was released in 2004, around the time of the third film. The game opens with a scene of a black dog watching as the Hogwarts Express speeds across a bridge towards a storm, where we join Harry, Ron and Hermione in their train carriage as they learn that the mass murderer Sirius Black has escaped from the wizard prison Azkaban. Professor Lupin sleeps in the corner when Hermione's cat, Crookshanks, chases Scabbers underneath the carriage door, and the trio go on the hunt for Ron's pet rat, giving control of Harry to the player. Similar controls are carried forwards from the Chamber of Secrets, where Harry can move around freely and cast spells with the mouse. The camera angle is quite far out and wide, and is mostly fine, although sometimes when you enter a new area, the camera tries to prevent you from turning back, and it can feel like you're battling it just to have a look around. You can still use Alohomora to open locks and chests, but instead of Flipendo, the spell Depulso is used to knock over or push objects or buttons. And confusingly, it has the Richter Sempra symbol from the last game. Not sure what the point of changing that was, but did you notice? That's Hermione you're now controlling. Throughout the game, you control either Harry, Ron or Hermione, depending on the situation, as they each learn different spells throughout the year. Although this does sound cool, you never get to choose to change the character yourself, instead the game just gives you control over whoever is needed in that section of the game. I think it would have been far more interesting instead if you could decide when and who to switch to, as this would have allowed the player to work out who is required when, and also could have allowed puzzles where characters must work together to progress, such as in Portal 2 multiplayer or Resident Evil Zero. The game has some situations where two or three characters must cast a spell at the same time to unlock certain doors, for example, but you always have the appropriate number of characters with you when you encounter these, so they really add very little and there might as well just be one character. However, having said all of that, I will admit it is kinda nice to have the trio together for a lot of the game, and it can feel good to knock over a massive cauldron together. Other returning spells include Lumos, Although, generally, the openings are right next to the statue and don't require much searching, and Richter Sempra, still used to attack magical creatures. This game features a fair amount of new creatures, more than the last game did, which just copied most of its creatures from the first game, including flying books and pages from the Monster Book of Monsters. The normal books are easy to dispatch, but the monster book pages snap viciously towards you after being hit with Richter Sempra. Chocolate frogs once again replenish your health if and when you get injured. Reaching the final carriage, Ron finally finds Scabbers when a Dementor bursts through the door, resulting in Harry fainting. Ron and Hermione attempt to block the door with luggage, but the Dementor pushes through. Professor Lupin appears and casts the Dementor away. Arriving at Hogwarts, you are taken right away to Defense Against the Dark Arts, where Ron learns Carpe Retractum, a spell that pulls the caster towards the grapple it is performed on. It can also be used to pull ropes and blocks and drag open certain doors. In this game, you don't have to learn the spell as in previous games, something that did add a bit more depth. Instead, you simply walk into the spell challenge. Challenge stars are replaced by shields, and the time limit imposed in the last game is gone again. A shame as I believe the time limit did add a good amount of tension to the challenges. This challenge itself isn't really that challenging, with only a handful of platforms where landing needs to be timed, although a number of returning creatures are reintroduced. Imps behave more like Draco Malfoy from the first game, throwing firecrackers that must be avoided and thrown back to defeat them. I actually quite like this cracker mechanic, as they require some skill to avoid and then aim, and can explode on the ground if left for too long. Pixies are also back, but this time throw blue projectiles the player must avoid, and they can be defeated with Richter Sempra rather easily. Interestingly though, in the previous game, both creatures would bite the player, but now both attack indirectly. In fact, there are barely any creatures that directly attack the player up close in this game. Fire crabs also return, and act the same as in the previous game. The challenge looks-wise is pretty good. 
with the stone architecture, dark voids and glowing purple grapples. Completing the challenge, no house points are awarded like in previous games, but instead if you manage to collect all 10 challenge shields, you are granted access to the bean bonus room. Bertie Bot's every flavour beans return once more, and this time there are even more. Just look at this! Fred and George have set up a proper shop this year, where beans can be traded for chocolate frogs and wizard cards. There are 80 wizard cards to collect, 74 of which can be gathered throughout the game, either by purchasing from a trader, one by completing certain minigames, or found throughout the castle. Two other forms of currency are also introduced, pumpkin pasties and cauldron cakes. Pumpkin pasties are rarer than beans, and can be traded for certain wizard cards. Cauldron cakes are even rarer, and are used to buy passwords for the various portraits around Hogwarts, behind which lie secret areas and surprises. I love the idea of there being certain portraits that require passwords to enter, and using a currency other than the main one is a good way of preventing players from gaining access to all of them too early on in the game. However, the addition of these portraits has seemingly replaced natural discovery, where none of the secrets in the main castle require spells learnt throughout the game, thus changing the wondrous feeling of, wow I get to explore the castle more as I learn more spells, to Wow, I'll get to explore the castle more as I earn more money. Peeves makes a reappearance, where he's had a fashionable new makeover, but still sounds just as good as in previous games. Ho ho ho, poor potty and weasel. He shows up occasionally to block Harry, Ron and Hermione's way, but they can cast spells together to get rid of him for a while. Heading to Care of Magical Creatures, we get to see the exterior of the castle, where the designers have done a great job of replicating the designs from the film. There are a few areas to explore outside, including this button pressing puzzle which is kinda cool, and this part where the floor collapses under you. This game throws a few of these surprises at you, I'm not gonna lie, I kinda think they're hilarious. There is also a pixie infestation that must be dealt with five times to earn a bunch of cards, but it's very repetitive and goes on a bit. Just seems a bit lazy and time consuming rather than challenging. Finally reaching Hagrid's class, you get to fly Buckbeak the Hippogriff. Hippogriff flying replaces the Quidditch sections of the previous two games, where Buckbeak controls a bit differently than a broomstick. Moving a bit like Flappy Bird but in 3D, Buckbeak's wings can be flapped by pressing the jump button, where you must navigate through a series of rings along a fixed path to earn points. You can return throughout the game to fly Buckbeak through increasingly more difficult routes and smaller rings to earn wizard cards. I really enjoyed Hippogriff flying, it's a lot better than the Quidditch in the second game, which had basically no challenge, and isn't quite as hard as the time flying in the first game, where one mistake could ruin your whole run. Instead, it's challenging but fair and takes some skill to work out when to time your flaps to pull off the perfect manoeuvre. When I played through this level with my uni housemates a couple of years ago, it took four of us to have a go to be able to get the final wizard card, and it was so much fun. After the lesson, Draco gets <coughs> by the Hippogriff, and the trio head to Transfiguration with Professor McGonagall. where Hermione learned two spells. The first, Lapifors, transforms statues into cute little rabbits which you get to control. They control exactly how you would expect a rabbit to control, hopping and bounding along, and they can eat grass and dig up soil to expose buttons and beans. The sections where you get to control rabbits are pretty straightforward, but they're so cute so who cares how simple they are. You also get to transform other statues into baby dragons with Draconophores, which again are really cute. Look at how they walk! They control similarly to Buckbeak by flapping their wings, and can collect fireballs to ignite lanterns to advance the level. They are pretty good to control, although their wings do get caught really easily on objects, preventing them from moving, which is pretty annoying. Bundymen are also introduced here, green slimy creatures that spit out harmful goo. They are defeated by stunning with Richter Sempra and then being jumped on but don't be too hasty as their toxic slime remains for a few seconds afterwards. Generally the challenge is good, and looks pretty nice too, lovely plants I'd live here. The following morning, Harry plays in the first Quidditch match of the season in really gloomy weather, where the other Quidditch players are just copy and pasted from the second game. However, the Dementors appear and Harry quickly faints. Lupin decides to teach Harry Expecto Patronum to defend himself from them. To cast it, the spell must be held down until the circle of light has reached the tip of his wand, where it then causes Dementors to freeze on the spot until all the Dementors in the area are eliminated. After the short lesson, the trio learn that Bugbeak is to be executed. They head to the library to research old cases to build an appeal, 
where Ron and Hermione use their newly learnt spells to reach a particular book to help Hagrid. Hermione mysteriously has already managed to drop the book off at Hagrid's when the trio regather outside the library, and head to Charms class, when they face a monster book attacking students. Similar to the imp infestation from earlier, again it is just another laborious task, where waves and waves of pages must be defeated to earn all five cards. In Charms class, Harry learns Glacius, a spell that can extinguish fires and freeze water. Amazonian salamanders, covered in flame, can spit fireballs at Harry, and can be frozen with Glacius. However, they are only fully eliminated when they are also smashed apart with Richter Sempra, and their main fire extinguished. The challenge also contains ice slides that are pretty fun to ride, and sometimes have branching paths and challenge shields. The environment here suits the challenge really well, with glowing red fires and cool blue ice, and the slides turn what would otherwise be an average challenge into an enjoyable one. Following the challenge, the trio head to Hagrid's hut to hear the verdict on Buckbeak, where they hear what sounds like an execution. Suddenly, Scabbers comes out of nowhere and Ron takes chase, the other two following closely behind. Arriving at the Whomping Willow, the strange black dog we saw before jumps out and attacks Ron, dragging him into a hidden path beneath the tree. Harry and Hermione cautiously follow, leading them to a gloomy tunnel. Following it through, they come across reanimated skeletons, defeated by casting Rick to Sempra together. There are also a number of block pushing puzzles, dragon flying sections, and ice slides. Good stuff. This section is pretty good, and the colours are really pretty, with the blue of the stone walls, yellows of the torches, and the glowing of various spells and creatures. Eventually, they reach the end of the tunnel, leading them to the Shrieking Shack, where they find Ron cowering away from the dog that turns out to be Sirius Black. Lupin comes out of nowhere, and explains that Sirius is not actually a dangerous man, and that Ron's rat is actually the disguised wizard Peter Pettigrew. The group head back outside to turn in Peter Pettigrew to Dumbledore, where it is now the middle of the night. The moon is full, but Lupin has a big secret. He's a werewolf. Sirius transforms back into a dog and tries to take down Lupin, but fails, while Pettigrew attacks Ron and escapes in rat form. Sirius runs off, where Harry finds him surrounded by Dementors, trying to fend them off with Expecto Patronum. Harry is eventually overwhelmed, about to succumb to the Dementors. He sees someone who looks like his father cast a strong Patronus that saves him, but surely not. It couldn't be. Now is a good time to look at the presentation of the game. Looks-wise, the game is a step up from the previous games, with improved lighting, shadows, and particle effects. The colours used in this game are less golden and more cool to match the more muted look of the film compared to the previous two. The game generally looks great, apart from a few notable exceptions. For example, all the background dementors are just flat animated images and really stick out compared to the rest of the 3D environment. The characters are a lot more animated and expressive than their counterparts in the previous game, with a lot more complex facial animation. The main trio can be very expressive. Keep that monster under control! Calm down, Ron! You don't want to wake Professor Lupin! But some of the other characters have had very little work done and are just terrifying. You'll earn a collector's card each time you defeat all the pages. There are five cards in all- Well done, Harry! And you got the collector's card too! Why does his tongue move like that? Ah! Voice acting is pretty great, with Stephen Fry narrating the game once more. Harry came away from the fall without injury, but he resolved to confront his fear of the Dementors. And some of the other lines, once again, are simply amazing. I don't go looking for trouble. Trouble usually finds me. I I'd stay and help, but uh, uh, I'm late. Yes, uh, very late indeed. It's easy to be brilliant when you're scared half to death. Sound effects are pretty good as usual, with highlights including the swish of the Carpe Retractum spell. Carpe Retractum! <laughs> the scratching of a rabbit digging up soil. And the charging up noise of Expecto Patronum. Expecto Patronum! Music is once again composed by Jeremy Soule, where a lot of the same pieces are used again from the previous games, with a few new pieces. Generally though, the feeling the game gives me is lazy, at least compared to the previous game, which was a big step up from the first game. For all of the new things this game brings, some of which are really great, there is an equal amount of things that were cut back on that take away some of the magic. For example, chests no longer jump and rattle around when unlocked, Chocolate frogs don't jump away from you when you try to eat them, and the moving parts of the Grand Staircase can't be walked around on. Instead, you are fixed into position as it moves, 
The dungeons are also demoted to simply containing two of the password portraits, with no other reason to explore there. It's probably my nostalgia for the second game that makes me feel this way about everything, but I think the game could have done a bit more to make discovering and exploring Hogwarts that bit more magical. Back to the main story, Harry wakes to find himself in the hospital wing, where Hermione is watching over him. Dumbledore informs them that Sirius Black is locked up, and only time will be able to help him. Hermione takes the hint and uses her time turner to take the pair back in time to before Buckbeak's execution, where you have to climb up to reach and release him. Later on in the night, Harry goes to watch his past self and Sirius being attacked by Dementors, and realises it was himself that saved them. You have to fend off a large amount of Dementors, a feat that seems really tense when in the moment. But I decided to leave them to attack me, and found out it takes over 1 minute and 40 seconds for them to reach you. Not much of a challenge after all then. It's at this point I realise that this is right near the end of the story, and I hadn't really had to face a proper boss battle yet. Defeating the Dementors, Harry casts a powerful Patronus that removes all the Dementors from the area for good. Harry and Hermione ride Bugbeak to rescue Sirius Black from the tower. Sirius, you'd better go! They'll be here any moment! Quick! Go! How can I ever thank- GO! The trio are reunited, and have to finish their final exams to complete the year, where each of them has an extra mini-challenge to test their spell casting once more. This is a great addition, as these challenges provide a bit more of actual challenge. Ron's test involves more timed platforming than was present in his original lesson. Hermione's has a great difficult long section where you have to fly a mini dragon through moving walls and spinning floors, and Harry's involves more sliding and defeating creatures. After completing all the challenges, all that is left is collecting all the remaining wizard cards. Once you gather 74, a 75th card can be obtained from Fred and George, Harry Potter, which transports you to the bonus bean room where the final five can be obtained, similar to the gold card challenge from the previous game. And finally, you're allowed to enjoy your summer holidays. Your father is alive in you, Harry, and shows himself most plainly when you have need of him. So, there we have it, the third instalment in the Harry Potter video game series. Now, I know that I probably sounded negative at times, but I want to emphasise it is still a good game, far better than The Philosopher's Stone was. But, as a diehard fan of the second game, I just can't help but feel disappointed. Overall though, it is still a fun little game that takes us back into the world of Harry Potter for the third time. Now, I haven't actually played any more of the main series Harry Potter games before, and looking them up, they haven't really been received very well. I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to cover next, but feel free to subscribe and find out, and I'll see you next time. Now for today's lesson, the um, where is he going? Did he ask to leave, or...? Ow. My bad, my bad. Well, looks like someone managed to put the logo on backwards. You're a bit short, Harry. I'm poor. Shove off! Slytherins don't talk to Gryffindors! Um, bitch, I was literally talking to this other person and you bumped into me, so... What are you talking about? But... Oh! The Time Turner! Time Turner? The Time Turner! The Time Turner!